everyone! Today we are going to be talking about how some musical symbols, specifically hairpins, might not mean what we think they mean. We generally think of hairpins as meaning get louder, crescendo, or get softer, decrescendo. However, they may have some additional meanings that we've overlooked. An idea investigated by pianist Roberto Poli in his book The Secret Life of Musical Notation, the main points of which we will explore today. We'll be looking at some of the alternate meanings for hairpins that he proposes. We'll also be tracing some of the history of musical notation to see how and why the meanings of these symbols have changed over time. And lastly, we'll be taking these ideas and seeing what we can do with them in our own playing. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video and thank you for watching. To start off, we need to define some terms that will be important to the rest of the video. Dynamics is the volume, or how loud or soft something is played. Crescendo is get louder, decrescendo is get softer. Agogics is defined as the fluctuation of tempo given by slight variations of pulse, where you keep the rhythm as is, but you bend it so it's not mathematically precise. Like in speech, strict rhythm would be mathematically. With some agogic inflection, it would be mathematically. It's not changing the rhythm, which would be mathematically. And it's also not as extreme as changing the tempo of an entire section. For example, allegro to adagio. Instead, it's much more subtle and kept within a smaller phrase. Like if I'm talking and I want to emphasize a certain word, I might slow down slightly on that word. It's not talking super fast versus talking super slow, it's much less noticeable. So now that we're hopefully on the same page with terminology, we can start looking at the history of the notation of hairpins and how their meaning has changed over time. In the 1700s, one thing that was generally taught and understood was that when the pitch of a musical passage goes up, the dynamics should also go up, and there should be a bit of a slowdown or a gogic inflection as you get closer to the highest pitch and loudest dynamic. These teachings were usually passed down verbally from teacher to student, much like how music lessons are taught today. Sheet music of that time was usually pretty sparse in expressive directions, like dynamics or agogics, and was often just bare bones notes. The hairpins that were there, according to Pulley's theory, which we will get to in a bit, indicated both an increase in volume and a slight slowdown, serving to confirm or clarify to performers those common performance practices. Around the early 1800s, composers started wanting to be more specific in their notation so that the performance of their pieces would be closer to what they had envisioned. They started writing more precise expressive directions, for example indicating exactly where to do crescendo or exactly when to do a ritardando or slow down. However, this had kind of a paradoxical effect. Since composers were now explicitly writing down things that used to be taught as a general rule of thumb, such as doing a crescendo and slowing down slightly when the pitch goes up, those principles didn't really need to be taught anymore since they were right there on the page. In this way, a lot of that knowledge of general performance practice was lost from the teaching curriculum. Furthermore, when over time more and more additions were made of a piece, each addition would accumulate more and more errors and move farther away from the original manuscript. The expressive markings that a performer would find on their sheet music could end up to be very different from what the composer actually wrote. And since many of those general performance practices weren't taught anymore, performers didn't know that their sheet music was misrepresenting what in the composer's day would have been common knowledge. The result of this is that by around the late 1800s, the meanings of certain musical symbols had shifted quite significantly. Hairpins, which used to indicate both dynamics and agogics, were now used to indicate only dynamics, and as composers wanted to be even more specific with their directions, they started using terms that were specific to agogics, such as ritardando and ritenuto. And since there were specific words for agogics, composers didn't need to use hairpins for that purpose anymore, and so they lost even more of their agogic meaning and became basically what we understand them to mean today, which is purely dynamics. And now for Roberto Poli's hypothesis of what hairpins really mean. His main argument is that hairpins do not only mean changes in dynamics, instead they indicate a variety of techniques. Dynamics, agogics, voices, or some combination of the three. Since dynamics are what is already taught today, we'll start with the agogic meaning of hairpins. Poli has three rules of thumb, and in his own words they are 1. An opening hairpin indicates taking time as the end of the symbol approaches, slightly slowing down. 2. A closing hairpin hairpin indicates lingering on the note or group of notes at the beginning of the symbol, gradually returning to the former speed, and three, as a result, an opening hairpin and a closing hairpin combines both elements, the phrase or group of notes being affected by some elasticity in the middle. 
These agogic meanings can be used instead of or in combination with dynamics, which would make them consistent with the performance practices of the 1700s. It's still trying to achieve the same effect of shaping a phrase and giving special importance to the top of that phrase. You're just using a wider palette of techniques to do so. And now I want to show you what this theory sounds like in practice, with what I regard as the epitome of masterful phrasing. The flute solo from the first movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, played by flutist Clara Andrada. It's so good. She doesn't just bring us to the top note, she makes it soar. If we listen again and pay special attention to the pulse, we see that the top note is both later and longer relative to the beat. techniques in use here, for example vibrato, the agogics play a pretty central role. This is just one example that I think deserves to be shared. Poli provides lots more in the book, mostly with piano music. The other possible meaning of hairpins is that they outline voices, or individual lines of melody that could be easily overlooked, especially in pieces that are really dense with counterpoint. There is a lot less info on this one, so I'm not really going to go too much in detail, and I'll just leave it at that. Hairpins just highlight and provide phrasings for voices that might otherwise get lost in a jumble of notes. And now that you know there are three possible meanings of hairpins, dynamics, agogics, and voices, or some combination of them, how do you decide which one they come composer meant. Poli basically said that you should use process of elimination and the assumption that there won't be redundant markings. For example, if you see a decrescendo along with a closing hairpin in a piece that doesn't have a lot of counterpoint, the hairpin most likely indicates agogics, because if it meant dynamics it would be redundant with the decrescendo, and since there isn't much counterpoint, there aren't really any inner voices that would need to be specially highlighted. Now that we've looked at the possible original meanings of hairpins, we need to understand why those meanings have shifted so much over time. In order to do that, we need to understand the role of editors and the various editions of music that have been published since the composer's original manuscript. First are the more mundane reasons why a score may morph over time. Editors could have copied things incorrectly by accident. Composers, being the fastidious creatures that they are, were never quite satisfied with their works and often made many revisions after the work had been published. For the more interesting sources of change, we can make an analogy to literature. I think that making an edition of music is less like copying directly in the same language and instead more like making a translation. This is because an editor has to make a number of decisions in the process of turning a jumbled mess of ideas into a nice readable score. Sometimes editors would change things on purpose because they felt like the composer had made a mistake. A commonly cited example is the introduction of Chopin's first ballade. This E flat is pretty tame by modern standards, but it might have seemed a little weird to the editors of Chopin's time, who often changed it to a D natural. The same thing happened with expressive markings, where editors simply removed markings that they thought were either redundant or a mistake. This not only moves us farther from the composer's intentions, it also implies that at this point, hairpins were believed by some to mean only dynamics. One especially interesting situation, also from Chopin's first ballade, is how smaller hairpins might have been mistakenly copied as accents. Thanks to the painstaking work of the online Chopin Variorum edition, we can see all of the first editions of Chopin's works and compare them measure by measure. Like here, we have the first Paris edition from 1836, the first Leipzig edition also from 1836, and etc. If we go ahead and play spot the difference for this one measure, there are already three that immediately stick out to me. The placement of the start of the pedal, either before or on the left hand note, the placement of the end of the pedal on beat 6 or the and of 6, and the length of the hairpins slash accent. This is something that I find both fascinating and utterly infuriating because when I played this piece, this section was one that I spent hours on trying to get the phrasing right because the accents always felt so weird and out of place, and it might have been because they weren't supposed to be accents, they were supposed to be hairpins. Which leads me to what is probably the most important part of the video. What does all this mean for performers? 
The implication here is that just because you are following every marking in the score does not necessarily mean that you are carrying out the composer's intentions. One, because your sheet music might not have all the same markings that the composer wrote. And two, even if you did have all or most of the markings, the meaning of those markings has changed over time. Also keep in mind that symbols may be inconsistent between composers depending on what time period they lived in or simply due to personal differences in writing style. The writing styles of individual composers also shifted throughout their careers, so a symbol used in one of their earlier works might not mean the same thing as that same symbol in a later work. And finally, for the purpose of this video, we've been assuming that the goal of a performer is to preserve the composer's intentions. We haven't even gotten to the whole notion of the performer's artistic freedom, and also the interesting question of whether the audience's tastes have shifted over time, and so maybe it's okay that performers are interpreting symbols differently from how they used to. But that is a whole other argument, and now bringing us back to what we can do with Pulley's ideas on hairpins. If you choose to apply them to your own playing, then we need to keep in mind some of the limitations of the study. I'm not saying it's a bad study or anything, just each investigation has its own inherent limitations. The author is a pianist, and so most of the example passages are from piano music, either solo or concerto. The first issue here is that the piano, when compared to other instruments, is itself limited in the ways that expression can be achieved, expression being the whole purpose of hairpins. For example, on piano you can't do things like vibrato, or dynamic swells in the middle of the note, or slight variations of pitch. If you were to apply Pulley's ideas to a different instrument, you might have to make some adjustments to best fit that particular instrument. And finally, most of Pulley's examples in the book were from slower, more lyrical passages, where agogics would be both expected and easier to pull off than in a faster, more rhythmic piece. So for hairpins in those more metronomic pieces, would agogics still apply, maybe just on a lesser scale? He does acknowledge that some composers only put hairpins in those slower pieces, which is kind of interesting and lines up with his theory. With all of those considerations, I think that Pulley's ideas are pretty solid and worth exploring, and even if you don't agree with the specifics of his theory, it still brings up a way of looking at music that I think we sometimes forget. Instead of simply relying on the markings on the score, we should also actively listen to our own playing, experiment with different ways of interpreting the same passage, and use our own intuition in deciding which one we think sounds best. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye!